I'm Stanley Brossman, and I am a urologist in private practice in Santa Monica. I was formerly was on the full-time faculty at UCLA, and I'm a clinical professor of urology at UCLA. I specialize in neurologic oncology and have been involved in a lot of research in various types of uh, cancers of the uh, urinary system, the most common of which is a prostate cancer. Dr. Brossman, how have the results of the PLCO trial, the European study, and other recent data changed the nature of the conversations between patients and their physicians about prostate cancer testing? There's a lot of misconception about what the PSA can and cannot do. Those tests were screening tests and they emanated from the years when September was considered to be Prostate Cancer Awareness Month and clinics were set up all around the country in which men were invited to come in and have a PSA blood test and in some cases a, a physical exam to examine their prostates. And that data was then subsequently tabulated and much of it was used then for these two tests that, uh, studies that uh, uh, you're, you're referring to. Well, these are screening studies. And in the office, we don't do screening studies. We're doing PSA for a specific reason. Um, when you go see your internist, they may screen your cholesterol, may screen your blood count, and so forth. But we're looking at PSA both as a measure of prostate size, and we look at its change over time as a determinant as to whether or not it is appropriate and necessary to make a biopsy of the prostate. A biopsy is a diagnostic test, albeit not 100% accurate, but the PSA does not diagnose prostate cancer. What percentage of your patients are either asking about or actually on some form of active surveillance today as opposed to getting early treatment? Well, I've always had a substantial number of men who are on active surveillance. Active surveillance has been around for 50 years. You know, it was originally started when men were having a lot of TURs of their prostates and the pathologist discovered a small amount of cancer. And it was determined that those people did not necessarily need to have treatment. They could be observed, i.e. active surveillance. So here we are 50 years ago. Now all of a sudden, in the last few years, it's become popular again, but for a different reason. Because now you'll make a biopsy and there'll be a small amount of low-grade cancer, and you'll say, well, should this man be treated or not? Well, what are the circumstances? Is this a 40-year-old who's starting to show up with cancer? Is this a 70-something-year-old man? You know, well, your position's going to, be, going to be different. And certainly, we are encouraging men who uh, are getting older and who have very small amounts of cancer to delay any type of intervention. How do you react to the suggestion that many prostate cancer advocates mislead newly diagnosed patients by advocating for or against specific types of treatment? Do you think patients actually cause problems in this manner? Well, patients tend to often listen to each other more than they do to their doctors. <laughs> and from that perspective, you say it, it makes things more difficult. Um, we are no longer in the habit of telling people what they must do, except to say, you must learn about this condition so that you can participate in the decision-making process. Now, we will discuss all the alternatives of therapy, including HIFU, freezing, and uh, the newer technologies as they come, <clears throat> as they come along. But, Ultimately, we have to come up with a plan as to how to manage your prostate cancer. And yours is different than your neighbor's. And therefore, the management may be completely different. Fortunately, we have a lot of choices. 
and by and large, they're good choices. And whether you have proton beam or not, all the units are effective. You know, this institution has this machine, which is better than the, their competing institution, and so on and so forth. But the radiation oncologists have developed their technology to the point that they deliver effective and safe therapy. And as long as you're being treated by a radiation oncologist who is experienced in prostate cancer, you ought to do very well. Same with surgery. As a urologist, it appears you are making a significant attempt to give new patients an appreciation for all the options that are available. Is that correct? Well, yes, but I do uh, make strong recommendations that they have a consultation with a radiation oncologist, and depending on the situation, with a medical oncologist as well, very early on, just to, which means following the diagnosis. And they also talk to their primary physician about their situation. The primary physician knows the, the individual much better than I do or any of the doctors who have just come on the scene. And their input can be very helpful. Uh, I think it's before a patient makes a decision is what type of management will be performed. They need to have the background and hearing it from multiple sources just gives them that opportunity. Looking over the past 15 years, what changes have you seen in the diagnosis and treatment of prostate cancer? Well, one of the great advances that has occurred in the prostate cancer is that we have taken a disease that 15 years ago would give you a life expectancy on average of about three years, and now we've converted that into a very long life expectancy. Our therapies have improved. Surgical technology has improved greatly. Blood loss from the surgery is down. Erectile function results are improved. Bladder control rates have improved. The same is true with radiation therapy. Safe and effective therapy. We've learned how to deal with the potential side effects of androgen deprivation therapy. We've learned how to control its use, when it should be used, how long it should be used, and how to deal with all the problems that men face. So these are great strides. And there are many more things coming along. How we will manage prostate cancer five years from now, it's hard to even guess. If you go back five years previously, it's different today. That's how fast things are moving. So there is great hope for everybody. Men should not be afraid of prostate cancer. It's not necessary. They need to know what their status is. They should start getting checked at age 40. They get baseline information that they do for everything else so that if they develop an active form of prostate cancer, they can initiate prompt intervention and not ever have to succumb to this disease. It should be a disease in which no one ever dies.